Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Katie Potter, and I'm going to um, introduce my co-host in a minute, but I just wanted to welcome everyone to our Social Activism Diverse Reading Webinar. We're going to be talking about social activism through children's books today. And I am joined by the amazingly wonderful Ina Pinnell St. Surin, who will introduce herself in a minute, but um, I just wanted to uh, tell everyone that um, this webinar is being recorded. I'll give a little bit more logistics in a minute. Um, so no, uh, no need to worry if you have to leave early or you can't make the whole live session. Um, we will be sending out the link to view the recording within a week. Um, so yes, so uh, a little bit about uh, myself. Um, I'm the literacy specialist here at Lee and Lowe Books, um, which is the largest multicultural children's book publisher in the country. Um, and we publish a wide range of titles from picture books to young adult. I, uh, I write and develop the teacher's guides that you see for, uh, for all of our books on the, on the website. We offer uh, free educator resources, such as the Social Activism Diverse Reading List, which we'll discuss in the webinar. Um, I work with, uh, educators like Ina and um, university professors and nonprofit organizations on how to incorporate diverse and multicultural literature into curriculum and um, respective syllabi. Uh, prior to this, I, I was a, a teacher, a literacy instructor, and I also worked in um, children's educational research on a variety of grants from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and I also have my master's um, from Bank Street College of Education, um, like Ina, and uh, in um, childhood general education grades one through six and uh, literacy. And now um, I am going to uh, let Ina introduce herself. Okay, thank you, Katie, and well, hi to everybody. and Welcome to the webinar, so glad you, you can join us. Um, and as Katie said, I am a teacher. I teach um, integrated co-teaching, ICT, at a school in Brooklyn. And uh, I'm teaching currently third grade um, in a teaching team that I'm so enjoying. Um, but yes, I, I also graduated from Bank Street College and I got my master's in special education. Uh, before that, I attended Cornell University and, uh, and got a degree in human development and family studies. And um, I have become a, a teacher consultant um, part time with um, a Responsive Classroom in the Center for Responsive Schools. And I'm also uh, involved in uh, anti-racist organizing as an educator with the Anti-Racist Alliance of Educators that's uh, based in New York City. And I also um, organize with the uh, uh, North, uh, with the New York region of the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, which uh, offers um, a workshop in um, undoing racism. Uh, that um, I'm also very involved in. And so that's a little bit about me and uh, my role as a teacher and my life outside of the classroom and inside of the classroom as an organizer. And thank you so much, Ina. And we want to thank you again um, for joining us. We are so honored to, I am so honored um, to be speaking about social activism with such a wonderful, uh, devoted, knowledgeable, and inspiring educator such as yourself. Yeah. Um, and we are so glad that you're able to share um, your experiences with our audience. Um, and so we just can't, we can't wait to share what you have to thank offer. You. Very honored to be here. So uh, a little bit about the agenda and what we're going uh, to discuss today. Ina is going to take us through her criteria for selecting excellent texts. As you heard, she has an incredibly extensive background in talking about um, anti-racist, anti-bias education, um, talking about social activism um, with, with children um, through, her, through her experiences. So she's going to be discussing about that and giving us some context before we really dive in to the specific details about so social activism and how to approach social activism through books and in the classroom or libraries, whatever environment you're working in. Um, then we're going to talk about, you know, why now? Why social activism um, and the timing of this webinar um, and our intentions behind that. Uh, then I will discuss the, uh, the development behind the social activism diver diverse reading list featuring um, some of our wonderful titles here at Lee and Lowe. 
Then we have a, a question that's free, that provides the framework for what we're going to talk about, how to, um, how to discuss social activism in the classroom and library. You know, how can engaging in social activism make a difference um, through books and through, through, children, through young people's actions? Um, then we're going to talk about current applications for social activism um, today through children's books. Uh, using books, um, more and more detail about uh, through social activism, and then answering some questions at the end. Again, uh, this is uh, being this webinar is being recorded, so an email will be sent out to all of the registrants. Uh, after the webinar, um, with a link to view the uh, to view the presentation, in addition to uh, the social activism diverse reading uh, list PDF, it's currently available. It's free on the website, but we'll um, we'll send it along in the email for your convenience, along with some links to the books and the uh, and the collections. Also, if you need a certificate, uh, you can always reach out to us. Um, so. That's, those are some logistics behind uh, before we really uh, discuss what we're going to do today. And now I will let Ina take it away with her uh, criteria for selecting excellent books. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as um, an educator in my class, I think that one of the things that's really important um, for me when I'm thinking about the books, um, especially about social activism, um, is that I rest on the fact that it's important to me to build a community of learners, to build a community in our classroom. And I respond, and I rely a lot on responsive classroom for that. Um, you know, the practices in responsive classroom are really uh, uh, crucial in, to me as an educator in helping us build our community so that we develop the trust that we need, that we have um, some feelings of safety and joy in our learning, and also so that we feel like as though um, uh, we can talk about tough topics, things that come up that might not feel as comfortable, that make us feel like as though um, we're trying to understand and interpret and figure out um, uh, uh, some of the issues that, that concern us. And so um, I think of it in two ways. One, centering on the students. And when I do that, um, I'm focusing on um, you know, what are the things that interest them? What are the things that are on their mind? Um, you know, what's going on in their lives? Um, it's also allowing me the chance to um, celebrate and appreciate the different cultures that they come from and the backgrounds that they come from and know that they are accepted in our environment. And then also um, to do this with some kind of sincerity so that when I'm thinking about the books, I'm always thinking about them and, and the importance of uh, things in their life. To me, um, I like to think of them as the quote unquote neo-indigenous um, people uh, that Christ Christopher Emden speaks about in his book um, for white people who teach in the hood and all your folks too. Um, I think that it's really important for us to look at them as having a lot of assets that they bring to the classroom. That even though they may not be um, focused, uh, that, that, that the things that they bring, the, the lives that they share, um, uh, may not be uh, part of the mainstream, you know, uh, colonized curricula that, you know, we often teach in our classrooms, that they have their own assets that they bring from their own backgrounds, their own lives, their own cultures, and that there, there's a place for that um, in our classroom because we know that um, history was made by a collective effort of many people from many different backgrounds and different races. And then I, I switch over to um, an educator's mindset and then really want to be thinking, um, am I really doing justice to their backgrounds and, and what they offer and bring into our classrooms by keeping in mind as an educator that I must be culturally responsive to um, uh, them as an educator and the backgrounds that they bring. And not just think about times when I want to celebrate, you know, Martin Luther King as a hero, you know, or a holiday, but then also really thinking about, you know, just making that more part of our lives for, you know, uh, times when, when there are people that we don't know much about or there are experiences that have happened in their lives that are, you know, deserve to be, you know, given recognition in the classroom. You know, I also try to be very mindful about, you know, not um, using stereotypical language when I'm um, speaking in my class. For example, if someone is wearing something that's traditional dress, you know, not to call it a costume, 
You know, um, those things can be very off-putting and, and very stereotypical. So I really make sure that I'm very um, aware of the language that I'm using. Um, I also enjoy very much networking, networking and consulting other educators and friends, you know, about um, things that they are passionate about and involved in that help me with my social activist work. Um, and that could be anything that has to do with Black Lives Matter or, you know, any anti-racist work. Um, you know, anti-bias work. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm making those connections with those people who are going to, you know, help me with furthering the, the goal that I have, making my classroom um, uh, a classroom of social activists. Um, making sure that my book selections are diverse is another important thing. Um, you know, I, I want to make sure that Korea is represented in my library. I want to make sure that um, Haiti is represented um, in, in my classroom library. And so, uh, you know, accessing the books and the titles uh, that express those, uh, those perspectives and those cultures become very important to me. And um, in part of selecting that um, as an educator, I want to think a lot about, am I hearing the story told by um, somebody who is actually from that community? Mm -hmm. that's <laughs> Or is it somebody else writing the story on behalf of, of telling the story? And I really wanted to have that authenticity and that sincerity. So I look for books that are written by people who, who write from the communities that they come from. And many times those people are often experiencing those marginalized um, experiences themselves. Um, mm -hmm. I wanna make sure that I uh, consult reputable organiz organizations like Lee and Low Books. Um, another one that I enjoy uh, um, consulting a lot or just even visiting their website is rethinkingschools.org. Um, certainly Responsive Classroom, I'm constantly on their website um, accessing their books and information. And um, just also making sure that I um, network with educators uh, who are reading the same books that I'm interested in. Like right now, um, we have a book club that we're organizing at our school just based on Zaretta Hammond's Cultural Responsive um, Teaching in the Brain. And so um, as an educator, I want to make sure that I maintain that kind of mindset as I continue um, providing instruction for my students. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ina. And I think that gives a, that provides a lot of uh, background knowledge and work that educators and librarians can do before even engaging in work um, like social activism. You have to have these different um, different things in place um, in your teaching and the way that you that you talk about literature in order for it to be the most impactful. Um, so thank you so much. And I found this to be it, to be super helpful for myself as a former educator, thinking with these two different lenses and how you approach books. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about the the purpose of this webinar um, and you know why why it's uh, why we decided uh, to present all of this information to you. So um, it, now particularly, particularly more than ever, it's essential to engage children with, with what's going on in the world. Um, that includes being honest and, sh and, and talking about what they're, what they're currently seeing on the news. Um, and also January is a great time to start fresh. Um, it provides a precedence for the rest of the school year and you can also bring in what students have learned in the first half of the year and then kind of use it to channel it into the a social um, activist uh, cho choice of their own, whether they or want they want, you know, if they want to be a part of a community organization and things that um, that you can do as an educator or librarian to help young people um, to bring them into the social activist work. Um, that also includes learning about previous social activists um, from history and, and today um, and utilizing um, their efforts, um, whether you talk about them through what's happening in the news or through books um, in order to advocate for change in today's society and in the library or community organization or classroom, whatever setting um, you're working in. Um, so uh, that brings me to the social activism diverse reading list. Again, I said this is free and available online as a resource. And uh, essentially this, this diverse reading list, um, you're able to discover characters and historical figures who stand up for peace, equity, and justice um, for gender, socioeconomic status, race, 
or the environment, all of those different causes. And you'll see in the list um, there, uh, each book has a specific tag and these are all of our uh, relevantly and low titles. Of course, we have so many more, but these are the ones that I just picked um, that can serve as mentor texts um, in the classroom or library. Um, so it's, as you can see, it's divided by grade. Um, and some of these I will talk about in more detail later on. Uh, and so you can see there's grade, um, and then they have a little um, theme at the end. Uh, so you can pick the book, you know, you can peruse the book page on the website and see if it's applicable to your work. Uh, so it also has a grades three to five um, and then a grades six to eight. I also wanted to say uh, about the grades six to eight, you'll see a lot of picture books in the grade six to eight. And of course you can use these beyond grades six to eight. You can use these in grades nine to 12. Personally, I think you can use a picture book at any age, specifically historical um, uh, information that's tackled in a picture book. It is so, um, it's chosen so carefully and it's uh, it's condensed but in a way that's really um, that is really impactful to the reader and also serves as a great mentor text for writing biography um, and a, a way to to gather an understanding of a historical figure through a picture book in less text than a chapter book uh, per se so uh, just a little plug for using picture books with older readers So Ina now is going to take us through, um, you know, how she views social activism and her definition before um, she takes us through specific books and activities. So when I think of social activism in the classroom, I'm thinking about um, how am I going to help my students um, to move toward uh, an understanding that social reform um, is a way of interacting with others so that we can make a change in our society or make a change in our world or our community or whatever toward something that we feel will improve it. Um, so social justice in, with my students means being upstanders or feeling that you even have a voice to express um, some of the concerns that you have, um, to express um, what you think you might wanna do to affect change in the world and just to help make the world more equitable, um, diverse, and, and to feel that, that there's justice for, for all and not just for some. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the ways that we have engaged in our classroom in making, a, you know, in making it more socially active and trying to make a difference is um, we have selected books. Um, we have a committee at our school called the One School, One Book Committee that selects uh, books that deal with various themes um, uh, that we meet together. And this is a committee that consists of parents and educators together, um, administrators, um, who are all working toward um, uh, selecting books that we feel might be important for kids to know about. Sometimes the books can be about topics that um, are, we're dealing with currently in society, like immigration, and so the name jar might be a good book for us to look at um, about a Korean girl who has to um, kind of like change her name or her, she, she doesn't feel the same uh, value and appreciation for her name anymore now having immigrated um, to times historically when um, people have taken a stand um, like in the book Sit-In which is about the Woolworth lunch counter and the men who sat, sat there um, and decided not to move until they were served or one Crazy Summer, which is a story about uh, three sisters who go out to California, Oakland, and uh, go out to meet their mother, who is a Black Panther, and talks all about the Black Panthers and the work that they did for their community. Um, and these three sisters go out there and they kind of um, uh, meet the uh, Black Panther Party and the work that they're doing through their mother's activism. So mm -hmm. uh, it's important for me to have titles like this um, in my class. And then again, also, um, you'll notice that the authors in these cases are authors who write from the communities. Um, I mean, authors who come from the communities that they write about. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that uh, I, I feel is really important when, when making that connection with uh, social activism is how am I able to take something that's being um, communicated in the story or in the book 
and bring it to the present day world. Like for example, this particular book sit in um, is about something that happened historically at a lunch counter. It was a sit in. Um, but one of the things that I really like about this picture is that um, for me, when I see it, and I want to make this connection for the help the kids make this connection is that this is totally similar to the whole um, Starbucks uh, sit in that kind of happened at Philadelphia. Um, where the, there were there were the uh, two black men who were asked to leave because they wanted to use the bathroom, but they didn't purchase anything, and you know they just continue to sit there and wait for their friend. So um, I could parallel uh, this particular historical mm -hmm. uh, uh, occasion um, with the Woolworth lunch counter to Starbucks and try to make it more relatable for the students. Um, and that's what I mean by having that educated mindset is being really familiar with you know the going on in the world and uh, making sure that I can make that connection for my students. Mm. It's a really powerful connection. And so um, some, of the, the, some of the other things that I would do is I would make sure that um, beyond the reading of the text that I'm actually engaging in some kind of activities to help further um, the students' appreciation of social activism. So for example, um, for younger grades, and even for older grades, but it's particularly uh, one activity that I like for younger grades is uh, using a thinking map, um, which is something that we use a lot in our school, uh, where they would compare different types of ways that people speak out through social activism um, in, uh, in the world with the various texts that I read. And so there'll be a bridge map in the next slide that kind of like explain how we can do a compare and contrast of different forms of social activism with texts that we read. And that would be something that we would build together, that map um, with uh, maybe grades K to two. And then um, in grades uh, three to five, I might decide to do uh, something that I've learned from the responsive classroom, which is a carousel, um, to get them to think critically. Um, and in order to um, accomplish something like that, I might have different charts at various tables. So I might have four charts at four different tables and small groups sitting at those tables. and post some, you know, critical thinking questions, you know, about um, the text. For example, um, if we're reading the text sit in, who else could have written this text? And, you know, an answer could be that um, the people who were sitting at the Starbucks uh, that day in Philadelphia could have also written this text. It's very similar. Um, you know, what positions of power are there that play out in the text? What position do the characters have? What position do I have? Um, are there stereotypes that are being challenged? So I want them to go and think a little bit more critically than just, you know, a who, what, where, when, why, mm -hmm. um, you know, retelling of the story and take it and elevate it up to a higher level of thinking on like Bloom's taxonomy, if we, if we want to think about that uh, theoretically, and move them into some real, you know, synthesizing and um, analyzing of the text. Um, so that might be something that I might do with the with fifth graders. Yeah, and I, 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 I love that activity, Ina, because it gives it gives students agency and they are working together as a group to come up with their points and then sharing out as opposed to you leading the discussion and kind of scaffolding them to get there like they, you know, they're creating their own thinking um, um, as, a, as part of a group. So I really, I found those questions really relevant to, to many of the texts that we're talking about today. So as they rotate from chart to chart with a different question on each chart, each group gets a chance to give their input. And it might not be the same input as maybe some the, a group before them did. Right. But the chart is completed. You know, everybody has rotated to all the different charts with their own imp impressions. If they want to agree, they can agree. They want to, to give a different perspective, they can. And it, but whatever they do, all the answers are all OK. There's no right or wrong. Sure. Totally. And this is applicable in, in, a, in a book group, in a library. You can do carousel activities in, in so many different educational settings. Yeah. Okay, and so this is an example of a bridge map. Um, this, uh, this is read with um, a relating factor that is you see in the center of your screen. Um, uh, and the relating factor is a form of social action in the book. So as we read the bridge map, as we go from um, left to right, we'll start off with the top word, and then there's a word that's underneath it. So the title of the book, I mean, the, the form of social action is on top, the title of the book is underneath. 
So I would read the bridge map that we would create together as a class as a sit-in is a form of social action in the book sit-in as a march is a form of social action in the book A Sweet Smell of Roses as um, a letter writing campaign is a form of social action in the book Mama's Nightingale as telling one's story is a form of social action in the Malala's Magic Pencil and so on. And so we would keep reading the bridge map as we go through these various titles and um, we read these books, we can keep adding on to the map. So the map continues to grow as mm. we you know, read one book and complete it and discuss it and then move on to another book. And we can keep adding on to the map and building it as we go along. I know, do you mind um, really quickly uh, talking about the taking a knee? Um, uh, clarifying that point a little bit because I really that really resonated with me and I think our audience would love to hear about how you use that in this bridge map. Yeah and so recently last year um, our class got into a discussion about taking a knee um, and uh, all the, the, all the uh, press that was given to football players for taking the knee and the criticism that they received um, for you know standing up with, about police brutality in our in our nation and so adding this on, what we did, we didn't read a book, a title, but what we did do is we had an article about taking a knee um, that we read. And so we added that article on to our bridge map. Um, so taking a knee is a form of social action. Um, in the article, football players say people are missing the point about their protest. So I was able to incorporate some of the work that we did um, with some of the articles that we read, not just the books, um, but, you know, um, there might be a, a video clip that maybe we watch on immigration, and I could add, you know, uh, something about um, protesting, you know, at the border. There's a form of social action in the video clip. Mm, okay, yeah. So there are, you know, ways that we can continue to add and build on um, with, beyond the books, but then as we move into other forms that are, of communication that inform us. Right. And this activity is so flexible. You could use this year round. You know, this isn't, it's not a stagnant one, you know, one lesson and done. Um, you can make it that, you know, you're just tying in um, students learning throughout the year through whatever literature, whether it's a book, a video, and that allows them to contribute constantly to this conversation about social activism. So I just absolutely uh, I'm thrilled with this activity and I'm certainly going to, you know, um, refer to this moving forward. I just found it so impactful and it really resonated with me. So, yeah. And so, um, these are, uh, some, uh, the books that I'm reading recently with my class. Um, oh, Ina, sorry. Do you mind speaking a little louder? Okay, yes. Yes. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so these are some books that I am actually using with my class right now. Um, we uh, just finished reading Through My Eyes, um, which is the story of Ruby Bridges and when she went to integrate the William France School. And um, we talked a lot about uh, what that must be like for a six-year-old and my students are third graders, so um, uh, they can relate to the age that she was, um, you know, trying to stand up for her right to an education um, you know, as supported through her family uh, and, and integrating a school. Um, and then making a text-to-text -text connection with yet another school, which is where I, I relied on Lee and Lowe um, and the book Armando and the Blue Top School, which is about a boy um, who grows up in a country where uh, he doesn't have a schoolhouse or a school building. And the teacher rolls out a blue tarp, and the blue tarp becomes... Um, the school for the neighborhood, for the community. Um, and we can make um, comparisons and contrasts, you know, um, between the two books uh, because there is an issue that's, um, you know, supporting both books that, that's kind of like comes up in both, which is facing obstacles when you want an education. You know, um, we can compare it through the lens of, of um, wanting an education and having those obstacles. And the obstacles could be poverty as it is in the Blue Top School. It could be racism as it is in Through My Eyes. And, you know, making some um, connections to our world today. Um, another objective could be that, you know, we want to uh, have the kids write new endings for the books. You know, let them think creatively 
and come up with um, different endings for the book. So, you know, for Ruby Bridges, how could we change the ending? You know, we wanted to write about that kind of theme today. But even for Armando and the Blue Chaps, who, how, what could be a, a different ending? And then um, another thing that I like to do is another responsive classroom activity that I love to use, which is the academic choice, where I give the children a choice of um, selecting, in this particular case, uh, um, what they would do to design the kind of school that would um, welcome both Ruby Bridges and Armando, and what would that environment look like? So all the children would all have to create the school. That's, the, that's what they have to do. But how the school looks would be the choice that they get to do. And so they get to create the school based on their own thoughts and feelings and perspectives. And um, each school that gets created would be different from the next school, but they would all be OK and acceptable. Um, so mm. we would do that in an academic course. And that also directly relates to your own classroom environment. You know, what do we want to have reflected at your school that you see here? Um, you know, what are, the, what are the qualities of a welcoming and caring environment? Um, so that, I think that's a really great way to talk about uh, classroom community as well. Okay, great. So thank you so much, Ina. Wow, um, so, much, so much to unpack and, and digest. You, you have such a wealth of knowledge and information about this topic. So um, with that, I'm going to talk about um, some Lee and Lowe titles um, that, I, that I specifically chose to talk about uh, social activism. So the first um, is, you could read this in grades pre-K to two or, or higher, but it's Lock Us in the Makibaka Hotel. And I, I really enjoy this book because I think it's a, a lighter approach to social activism. Um, so Lock Us is the main character that you see. He's holding a sign. Um, he lives in this really diverse neighborhood um, with a lot of friends who, who um, reside in a hotel. Um, and so he hears that the hotel is going, that they're um, being evicted from the hotel. And he basically starts this grassroots campaign in, um, in, um, cam in protesting for the tenants to stay. And there are so many bright um, illustrations that are engaging. Um, and this is, a, this is a way to show, uh, to show young people that they too can be involved in their community and can start something that they're, that they're passionate about. So that's uh, Lock Us in the Makibaka Hotel. Um, next is um, one of our newest, uh, newest titles here, Malala Yousafzai, uh, Warrior uh, with Words. Um, Malala's uh, story is well known um, to many of us um, and will always inspire, but she certainly is the symbol of courage and activism to children and people worldwide um, for universal education. And also she, uh, she really shows the power that education has in being a tool for um, positive social change. It's also um, available in Spanish. Um, it's it's uh, newly released on our website. Um, the Back Matter specifically has additional social activism organizations, more information about the Malala Fund, uh, Malala's um, organization uh, for a worldwide education. Um, this is also, you know, all, many of our books have, um, have extensive Back Matter that include organizations like that um, for students to and children to look at and uh, conduct research of their own. Um, and that also goes for Ahinza, which is a which is a middle grade um, chapter book uh, for young people, grades six to eight. But certainly, high schoolers can read it. Um, so, God, uh, during the Indian free, freedom movement, Gandhi asked one member of each family to join the the fight for independence from Britain. And Anjali, the main character, uh, her mother um, is jailed for being a part of this movement. And so Anjali has to step out of her comfort zone um, to take over her mother's important work. Uh, not only does it talk about Gandhi, but it talks about some other, uh, some other um, protesters and fighters for the Indian freedom movement in addition to Gandhi, which is important to, to learn about as well. Um, and um, interestingly enough, it was inspired by the author um, 
the author's great grandmother's experience in working uh, with Gandhi. So you can read about that um, in the in the author's note at the back. So I'm going to um, I'm going to highlight Ahimsa specifically, um, and again, this is for uh, grades six to eight, or you know, certainly could be for a fourth or fifth grader, or or for a high schooler. And I wanted uh, we have teachers' guides for our books that are on the book pages on our website. They're free and available for educators to use with interdisciplinary activities and lots of different questions that, uh, that young people can engage with. So I wanted to pick two of my favorites from that teacher's guide um, for grades six to eight and uh, grades nine to 12. So as I had mentioned previously, you can have um, uh, for students to learn more about social activism, specifically during the, um, during the movement for Indian independence from Britain, you can have students research other Indian freedom fighters besides Mahatma Gandhi. Um, and there's more, informa uh, more detailed information in the teacher's guide, so you'll have to check it out. Um, but you can have students investigate these freedom fighters in groups and um, prepare visual presentations for the class with photographs or videos um, to, you know, to give students more of an idea of who also was feeding, uh, fighting for the Indian independence from Britain um, because one of our you know one of our priorities here at Lee and Lowe is to give voice to those who are un underrepresented as Ina had mentioned earlier that's critical in her work and it's also critical for us here um, and giving those um, unsung heroes of also a voice um, so in grades 9 to 12 um, uh, Supriya Kelkar the author writes in her author's note and I've found this um, incredibly prolific. She says, well, not all freedom fighters were social reformers. Some did believe there was a dual struggle, an internal one battling the social injustice in India and an external one against the British. Because when independence was eventually gained, the country's social problems had to be solved. So you can uh, have students uh, talk about the internal and external struggles and research more about why those conflicts were happening. So um, I wanted to include some titles that I thought were particularly relevant to today um, and getting uh, young people involved in social activism in your community or um, whether it's learning about it in the news or in your, sp in your specific environment. So um, Destiny's Gift. Um, so as you can see on the front, there's a young girl, Destiny, and Mrs. Wade, she's the owner of, her, of Destiny's beloved bookstore in her neighborhood. Um, Destiny often helps Mrs. Wade with the bookstore, um, and she hears that Mrs. Wade um, may have to close the store. And so she, um, she engages people in her community to rally behind the bookstore. And um, I'll show you um, some illustrations in a minute. Um, but it's really powerful and it captures the heart of how, um, how when a community comes together, you can accomplish a lot. And this is also near and dear to my heart because my mom is an, is an owner of an independent bookstore. So, um, check out Destiny's Gift, that's uh, for grades pre-K to two. For grades three to five, I recommend Friends from the Other Side, Amigo del Otro Lado. It's a bilingual title, um, and it's the story of a friendship between, between Prietita and Joaquin. Um, Joaquin and his mother recently crossed the Rio Grande River in Texas um, in search of a new life. Um, and so Priyatitsa has to often come to his aid to, to defend him from the neighborhood kids who are constantly taunting him with um, insults such as mojado or wetback. Um, and so she, um, uh, she also realizes that one day border patrol is cruising through their neighborhood and she helps Joaquin and his mother escape to safety. Um, so both author and illustrator are um, are Latinx and grew up in South Texas, so they are own voices, um, and they give a really critical perspective on this issue. Of course, this is certainly relevant to what's going on in the news today, and you can use this book in um, your library or classroom in order to um, to give uh, children a perspective through a young person's eyes as shown through this story, um, and it could possibly help them make better sense of what's happening at the border in this country today. Um, 
Lastly, I am Alfonso Jones is uh, the first graphic novel about the Black Lives Matter movement. This I would say is for grades six to eight and up. Um, so Alfonso Jones, um, he can't, the, the main character can't wait to play the role of Hamlet. Um, and he wants to, he has a lot of positive things going on in his life. Um, he's buying his first suit um, in a department store and an off-duty police officer uh, mistakes his clothes hanger for a gun and he shoots Alfonso. So Alfonso wakes up in the afterlife in a ghost train that's guided by well-known victims of police shootings. Um, and so uh, it kind of goes back and forth between Alfonso in the subterranean world and also with Alfonso's family and friends who are, who are struggling with his grief and, um, and protesting um, in working for the, you know, working for justice. Um, so this is uh, a perfect text uh, now, uh, all year, but now because um, Black Lives Matter Week of Action is the first week of February. So please check this out. Please check out Black Lives Matter, the, the syllabus that's available online. I know that I'm always consulting it. Um, so, uh, so check out both of those resources. And the Teacher's Guide for I Am Alfonso Jones also gives more organizations and different activities to use with this book. Um, so here are some spreads um, that I thought were relevant to the social activist work in the book. So you can see here, Destiny uh, created a bake sale. She's gathering all of this attention in her community to help out her local bookstore. Friends from the other side, you see Priyatita and Joaquin, they're going into the house. Um, you know, this is, a, this is such a moving book and and very applicable for to what's happening today. And then also this is a spread from I am Alfonso Jones showing Alfonso's family and friends who are protesting um, and uh, through, through the Black Lives Matter movement on the streets um, and working for his, uh, working for justice. Um, so these are some activities that I thought were, were relevant. So in Destiny's Gift, um, like I said earlier, you can engage uh, your young people in whatever setting you're working with to, to, um, <clears throat> to look up different places in the community and provide support for, um, for small businesses and organizations. This is kind of a child, young person-sized way of, of approaching social activists in, in their neighborhood. Friends from the other side um, is a, is on a grand uh, is on a larger scale nation nationwide scale of what's happening with immigration in, at the border, and this is a way to tie in children with ha what's happening in the news and how to process what they're seeing in the media. And then uh, similarly with I am Alfonso Jones um, designing a lesson on on Black Lives Matter, um, learning more about the the founders, the core beliefs. Um, the challenges and connections to a social justice movement today. So now Ina is going to, um, to lead us in our conclusion and in additional tips and strategies on using literature that showcases social activism. Yeah, and so um, in your classroom, especially now that this is a, a halfway point of the school year uh, for many, um, you know, you want to be able to create those opportunities where you celebrate the diversity of um, your class. Um, you know, accept the children for who they are um, and welcome them uh, into the habit of sharing about their background. Make sure that they feel like as though there's, a, there's room for them in, in your classroom and their backgrounds and their cultures and their experiences. Um, I know, sorry, do you mind speaking a little up a little bit? Yeah, I, oh, yeah, come a little closer. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah. So what I had said was that you want to make sure that you have an environment where the children feel welcome enough to share about their backgrounds and their cultures and their diversity. Um, we all get an opportunity to learn from each other that way. Um, and you never know, you can make new connections um, with your students once they learn, you know, about uh, somebody else's uh, experiences or background. Um, uh, I see that happen year after year where new connections are made um, and we do a lot of sharing. We share on a daily basis in our class, especially when we do responsive classroom morning meetings. There's a shared component built into morning meeting. And so we're constantly learning about each other and our experiences and hoping that um, that is going to create for more diversity and more acceptance. Um, 
we want them to be able to take some ownership in the learning in their environments to be able to give them that opportunity to choose and make choices and to um, uh, do some of the activities that both Katie and I spoke about um, uh, allows them that chance to express themselves and find that they do have autonomy in the classroom. Um, we want to try to make sure that things feel balanced and that uh, we differentiate our instruction so that all students feel like they're included in uh, and can partake in um, the, the lessons that are going on in the classroom. Um, and then um, most importantly is to diversify your curricula um, so that you know all voices are represented so that no one's voice is dominant over everybody else's voice. You know, we know that um, education is very colonized um, but we want to make sure that the people who also made history in our country are also having their voices represented and, and the struggles. And it might just add a different perspective to history, but it's an important perspective if we're all going to be able to understand just exactly the impact that everybody has had on making history in our country. And, you know, especially make sure that kids learn uh, and are encouraged to care about each other. I think that's really important to have empathy and be empathic. Um, toward each other in the classroom. Great. Uh, these are some more, more points that, that Ina had mentioned um, earlier. Yeah, um, I think that it's important for, you know, uh, children to be able to share their unique stories too and not be yeah. judged or criticized. Um, that uh, we can use theme texts um, that are addressing a particular theme in social activism and, um, and just incorporate more texts that do that same um, job of focusing on that particular theme in social um, activism. You know, challenging children with um, critical thinking questions, really get them thinking about their, their world and questioning it um, uh, to the point where they feel like they have the right to do so um, and, and, and that they can feel comfortable um, knowing that they can make a change in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, uh, you know, just allowing those opportunities for children to interact with each other is really important so that they will be able to know how to handle dealing with a uh, perspective or an opinion that's different from theirs without feeling like as though um, uh, there's no place for it. We want everybody to feel like as though uh, the things that are on their mind, the, the um, uh, concerns that they have, uh, the perspectives that they take are all welcome and there is a place that there's no one dominance of, of one perspective over another so that people don't feel marginalized. Mm -hmm. Totally. So we have, um, thank you, Ina. Um, we have collections where you can look at the books. Uh, certainly you can look at the books in the list, but then we have collections online for purchase. Um, these are all the respective links. Again, they'll be sent out in the email within the, a week of this webinar. Um, and you can look at all of the books um, in the respective um, categories and, and grades um, at these links. So um, now we're going to have a few minutes um, for question and answer. Um, so I wanted to um, approach the first question that, ca that came up. Um, so how many titles do you have available in Spanish? Um, this teacher um, teaches in a Spanish immersion school and wants to find diverse books in Spanish. So we have quite an extensive collection of bilingual titles in English, um, in English and Spanish, as you saw from friends from the other side. We also have dual language editions, English and Spanish, um, that, like you saw with Malala. Um, we also just released our Spanish authentic, um, our Spanish authentic list, where um, all of the books in the list are from own voices from Spanish, uh, from Latinx authors and illustrators from the backgrounds that are represented in the books. Um, so we take it very seriously. Um, we also have um, early readers for you all who are working with um, with young children who are just starting to read. We have um, our, imp our specific imprint geared towards leveled readers called Bebop Books and um, Mas Pañada Books, which is part of Bebop, that have English and Spanish um, components for each um, leveled reader. And you can find out about that more on the website. But I wanted to, um, to, to let everyone know about that. 
So, um, Ina, I have a question for you. And since you are an expert in this field, um, some people wanted to know what are some different organizations that I can join across the country to learn more about social activist work for educators and young people? So some of the ones that I hold dear to me um, in terms of the organizations and the work that they do with social activism, one is uh, Rethinking Schools. Dot org, which is a website, um, but the amount of teacher resources that they have on their website is very impressive. Um, and uh, a lot of times, Rethinking Schools, um, it, they offer workshops in various uh, states across the country. Um, and that was one of the ways that I connected with them was that I just went to one of their workshops um, uh, as part of a, a, a particular, I think it was a symposium or something, and they were there. And I attended a workshop where uh, they were teaching me about how I could uh, talk about um, abolitionism in my classroom. Um, mm -hmm. And incorporated and used in my, in my class year after year. Um, another organization um, is the Anti-Racist Alliance of Educators. Um, which comes out of uh, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Um, this is a group of, of teachers, uh, educators, um, that come from public schools, private schools, colleges, um, uh, religious schools, charter schools. We all get together and we um, uh, discuss some of the issues that uh, we are finding as we try to do anti-racist work, the social, active work uh, social activist work in our schools. Um, and then, um, as I said before, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, which is headquartered in New Orleans, Louisiana, but they do trainings called the Undoing Racism Workshop, and they do this all across the country, um, even uh, they branch out into the world around us, um, and they really tackle issues of racism um, uh, in their uh, workshops that um, really is very impactful. And I know, um, Katie, you yeah, so all of our, um, I just wanted to say to the, to the listeners, Re Ina's first organization was um, Responsive Classroom. So Responsive Classroom and responsiveclassroom.org. Um, but um, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, we um, here at Lee and Lowe attend, uh, attend the training. Uh, it was life changing for me um, as an employee at Lee and Lowe, just as a, as a person. Um, uh, living in this in this world today, um, so it's beneficial, I think, for um, for educators, librarians, everyone. Um, so I and and going on their website, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, like Ina said, you can find out more information about trainings, not specifically in New York City, but all over all over the place. And they also have meetings where you can um, where you can join with fellow um, fellow attendees. Like if you want to continue, there's so much that comes up. So it's important to continue the conversation and continuing to work towards the same goal. And if you're in the uh, New York State region, then they uh, have a very specific website, antiracistalliance.com, which also lists a lot of the gatherings that happen and the collectives that happen around that that section of the country in New York State um, uh, that, you know, maybe people who live in the tri-state area might want to access. And I also did want to uh, add on to what you had said, uh, Katie, about responsive classroom, um, because they do offer workshops that are week-long institutes in the summer. Um, they also offer one-day workshops all across the country, and they have now branched out into, you know, uh, other continents in the world. So uh, I'm a very valuable um, organization that I'd like to connect uh, with. Great. Thank you, Ina. Um, one, last, one last question before we, um, before we conclude. Um, what, Ina, this is specifically for you um, because you spoke so eloquently about it. And what was, um, one of our participants wants to know, what would you say is the most important ingredient to have in a community setting, classroom, you know, whatever, um, for people to feel safe sharing their own opinions and perspectives. Okay, so I think in building that community, um, there has to be acceptance of, of people in the community from all different backgrounds. Um, I think one of the ways that we learn to accept each other is to encourage them to share. 
Um, and by through that sharing um, and allowing people to ask questions about that particular person's background, uh, which we do in responsive classroom in our morning meeting, um, it allows the children to start to feel safe that, you know what, my particular background is accepted here. Um, it's not just something that's tolerated, but I can actually share about my, myself, my life, my experiences. And, um, I, you know, you will notice that other connections will start to get made from maybe some of the other students in the class. And that's what you really want to do is that community building where um, children do feel safe um, and feel like as though they are accepted. So I think having that acceptance and that empathy um, are really key, you know, uh, qualities that you want to make sure that you are building um, your classroom on, that that's kind of like a foundation upon which you want to continue to build your, your, your community of learners. Great. Um, do you mind giving us an example of like a morning meeting activity that you love, that you love or that your students enjoy? Yeah. So I think um, one of the things that uh, uh, a morning meeting activity that I really enjoy doing um, is something called pattern ball. And um, it's an activity where um, we sit around in a circle um, or on the edge of our rug. And we take a, a plush, you know, light, lightweight ball that we uh, pass around. Um, and the, th the reason why it's called pattern ball is that we'll start with one student. I usually pick a stick out of a, or a name out of a box. And that person will decide to throw it to one person. And then that person who received it, who just received it, decides to throw it to another person. And so as we keep passing it around the circle, there's a pattern that is created. Once we make sure that everybody has had that opportunity to receive the ball, then we check our pattern, and so we, we start a, a round that's not timed, where they throw the pad, they throw the ball to all the different people in the um, in the pattern that we just set, and then we put the clock on and we time it, and we see how long it takes us to get that ball around the whole circle until the last person says time. We check the clock and we see, oh, okay, well we made 35 seconds, so let's try to beat it, and the amount of cooperation that takes place. Yeah students, you know, just, you know, being mindful that they have to um, keep the pattern going and um, that they're doing uh, uh, a lot of cooperation in that particular activity and they're all dependent on each other. Mm. The time, you know, is one of the kids' favorite activities that we do in our morning meeting. Um, and that's called pattern ball. Um, and that also, that also sets the foundation for the activities that you had mentioned earlier, the carousel and having everyone work together and understand each other and that you're all part of it, you know. Um, I, I think that's really great and connects to so many different classroom community activities. So social skills of like cooperation. Yeah. Empathy, you know, having the self-control to make sure that you can get the ball passed. You know, there's so many things, the responsibility of making sure that the next person gets it. There's so many, um, um, uh, social skills that get incorporated into that that really lend itself, like you said, Katie, into the classroom when we go into work time. Right. You want to have cooperation. You want to have responsibility. You want to have self control. You want to be able to assert ourselves, um, be empathic toward people's perspectives and, and things that they have to say. So that's great. Yeah. So um, you can contact us here. Please reach out with any questions that you might have uh, so we can, can continue to talk about social activism. If, please share your ideas um, with me, um, what, how, you talk, how you approach social activism in your library or classroom. Um, and feel free to follow us, um, Lee and Lowe, on social media, um, on all of our different channels, um, the blog, particular, you know, all of our channels are, we are always coming up with great content and check out our blog for more ideas and, um, and different series about uh, culturally responsive teaching and using our books in, in the classroom. So again, Thank you so much, Ina, for joining, uh, for joining me today. Wow, uh, such amazing information um, and useful material to take with us, um, to take with all of us in our respective work. So thank you so much. For inviting me to be part of the panel. And yes. thank everyone for um, tuning in and watching and, and participating in it. Um, I hope you do reach out to us, um, you know, with further concerns or, you know, further connections. 
um, you know, this the network now that we have, and it's been really nice to kind of keep it going. Yeah. I you know, hope to see you again at another webinar or something. Who knows? And maybe. In yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ina. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, goodbye. Bye, everybody.